Hello and welcome to our second video dealing with Congress. This is topic two and we're going to be talking about organization and leadership. Alright, so how is Congress organized? We've already mentioned the fact that our Congress is a bicameral uh, body, which means it has two houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives. The U.S. Congress and all of the other state governments in the United States have bicameral legislatures, which means they have two bodies, except Nebraska. Nebraska has a unicameral state legislature, which makes it different from all of the other 50 states. All right, so here are some key differences between our House and Senate and the national government. All right, and you'll notice here the House of Representatives, uh, this chart is pretty interesting and actually pretty important. It's something you're going to be using um, in class. House of Representatives, you'll see there its constitutional powers. It initiates bills dealing with revenue, with money. Um, it is the first point or first um, step in the impeachment process. Um, as you can see there, there's some lists of the number of members. It's much larger than the Senate. Terms are different. Smaller constituency. Leadership and rules. This is something that's going to occur as we go through these slides. Much more important and critical um, in the House of Representatives than in the Senate. There is much more of a domestic focus on um, policy making in the House of Representatives. And we know that the House enjoys a very large incumbency advantage. Okay. Um, the House of Representatives has a few things that the Senate does not have. One is a rules committee, which we'll talk about here in a second. And two, there is limited debate in the House. The House can move on from any issue with a simple majority vote, whereas in the Senate they do have the option of filibuster, which we'll talk about here soon. All right, the House of Representatives, again, larger, much more institutionalized than the Senate. It is more formal, it has more structure, and there are more rules. Uh, party loyalty and partisanship is much, much stronger in the House of Representatives. If you're going to look at the two bodies and you're going to talk about gridlock, you're going to really look at the House um, as a model of gridlock. There is not much crossing the aisle on the House. Much of the compromise that takes place in our system takes place on the Senate side, where senators are more willing to cross the aisle. And again, as I mentioned before, debate in the House can be ended by a simple majority vote. All right, as mentioned before, the one institution that is special to the House that the Senate does not have is called the Rules Committee. This is the committee that every single bill that makes it through its own committee will go to. This Rules Committee is very important. It gives the Speaker of the House and the majority party a ton of power. That Rules Committee, again, is very responsive to the leadership of the House, to the Speaker of the House, because he appoints those members. It serves as kind of like a traffic cop in the House of Representatives. Um, if a bill was to make it out of a committee and it was something that the majority party was not interested in pursuing, they can kill the bill at the Rules Committee. Again, they control the schedule. They control what's being debated in the larger house. They basically can stop the process of a bill moving forward. And they can also expedite the process of a bill moving forward if it's something that uh, the majority party is interested in. All right, the Senate is less disciplined and less centralized in the House. In terms of discipline, we're talking about the um, leadership structure is not as rigid in the Senate. Again, it's a lot more like, uh, I'm not going to say a country club attitude, but it's an attitude where you have um, a group of 100 peers. You know, there isn't as much, hey, I'm, I'm a higher party leader, I have more seniority. When you make it to the Senate, they, they treat each other as equals. Um, party leaders serve as the Senate scheduler. They make the schedule, so there is no real specific rules committee. Um, that exists on the Senate side. And the Senate has something called the filibuster. And I think most of you are familiar with this. This is a strategy that exists only in the Senate, where if you are an opponent to a piece of legislation that is moving, you have the right to what's called unlimited debate. You can prevent the passage, prevent action on any bill, because you can gum up or you can delay on the floor of the Senate. All right, And the minority party can do this if they're not excited about a piece of legislation that's moving forward. They can filibuster it. All right. In some cases, the threat of a filibuster is enough to delay or keep or change a piece of legislation from moving forward. Filibusters can be uh, limited by what's called cloture, but you need 60 out of 100 senators to vote to end um, a filibuster. All right, Speaker of the House, the most powerful position in Congress. Again, it's the third most powerful position in the country, some would say behind the president and the vice president. Um, it is a position that is discussed in the Constitution, one of the very few positions that is discussed. Um, from that Speaker of the House position, um, we have on the House side a majority and a minority leader. We also have a major majority and a minority leader on the Senate side. Again, the majority leader is going to be the principal partisan ally of the Speaker of the House, 
or the majority party's manager in the Senate because the Senate does not have a speaker. All right, these minority and majority party leaders are going to be assisted by whips. These whips are going to be other party leaders who are going to work with those minority and majority party leaders to count votes. Um, and their main job is to make sure that the party is in line, that they're getting the proper support from their party members, and they will lean or attempt to influence those party members um, to vote in line or in concert with the rest of the party. Okay. And again, minority and majority party leaders really serve the same purpose. They're trying to marshal their resources and marshal those votes together so that they can have impact, that they can stay unified. All right, the president of the Senate um, is the vice president of the United States. The vice president doesn't um, really do much. Um, there isn't much of an, a role for the vice president of the United States in the Senate. Um, his function is really just to break ties in the event that one occurs. And they do occur from time to time. Um, the vice president will not be there on Capitol Hill working with the Senate on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that is actually delegated to what's called the president pro tempore, and that's the Senate position. It's a senior member of the party, and it's picked to preside in the absence of the vice president. All right. So vice presidents don't have much of a role in terms of operating or running day-to-day um, -day activities in the Senate. They will work behind the scenes. They will make sure or work in concert with the majority party leader, the minority party leader, to make sure everyone knows the president's position on pieces of legislation. Um, Dick Cheney, when he was vice president, would have breakfast with Senate leadership on Tuesdays. Um, so again, they work behind the scenes, but they don't have as much of a formal role um, in the Senate. All right, despite all of the statute and power, congressional leaders do not always have the power to move all of their members in one direction. A great example of that um, is the current Speaker of the House, Boehner, and his struggles with the, with the Republican Party at large and the Tea Party. Power of uh, both houses of Congress is really decentralized. Congressmen can operate on their own, um, and again, it's decentralized with the idea that they can have their or make their own decisions. Leaders, or these positions, are elected by their party members. So the Speaker of the House is picked by members of the party. Um, the majority and minority party leaders are elected. Whips are elected by their parties. So it is important, if they want to keep their jobs, that they remain very responsive to the party at large. All right, committees. Most of the work of Congress is going to happen in a committee. Committees are going to divide the workload and allow Congress to operate and to function, you know, with the thousands of bills and pieces of legislation, legislative oversight, hearings, all of the things that Congress does, they need to divide up the work. Um, committee chairs or congressmen that are placed in front of these work groups or in charge of these work groups have a ton of power. They set these committees' agendas. They're going to assign their members of their larger committee to different subcommittees, and they really have the power to decide on which bills are going to have public hearings, um, what witnesses are going to call, be called to these public hearings and discussions of these new pieces of legislation, and they ultimately do have the power to kill bills. Most bills are going to die in Congress, and probably the most popular place for those bills to die is in committee. All right, so committee chairpersons are very influential. Traditionally, committee chairs were picked by seniority status, how long they had served in that particular committee. If you had 15 years and you're the longer serving member, you became the chairperson. Today, the rules are going to permit those who are not the most senior um, to be named chairperson. So it's not necessarily the person with 15 or 20 years of service, um, but it is going to be someone with some experience serving on the committee that gets that job. Membership on committees is going to reflect the overall breakdown of Democrats and Republicans in the House of Representatives. For example, there you'll see the House Armed Services Committee currently has 34 Republicans and 28 Democrats, and that's a reflection of the overall breakdown of the House of Representatives with a Republican majority. All right, different types of committees. We have standing committees. Those are the permanent committees, the subject matter committees. They're going to handle bills in different policy areas. For example, the Armed Services Committee, um, Committee on Budget. There are, are numerous committees, which we'll see here in a second, um, and those are permanent. They last from Congress to Congress, from term to term. Joint committees are going to be committees that are going to be focused on very specific subject matter um, with membership drawn from both the House and the Senate. So it's going to be a joint committee between the two bodies. You also have a conference committee. Conference committees are put together when two different versions of the same bill are going to come out of the House and the Senate. Um, the president can only sign one bill. Congress can only produce one final version. So that conference committee with members of both the House and the Senate are going to come together and iron out those differences and come together on one bill to be sent to the president. Select committees are created for a very specific purpose. Again, the Watergate investigation or the 9-11 investigation are examples of select committees. And these are, can be formed either on the House, a House Select Committee or a Senate Select Committee. They're specific to their body. Here's an example of some of the standing committees in both the House and the Senate. 
All right, committees and subcommittees, more than 9,000 bills are submitted each and every year by members of Congress um, over a two-year period, about 9,000 bills, so work that out, um, over 4,000 per year. Each bill goes to a committee, which has virtually the power of life and death over it. Um, these committees are also going to practice what's called legislative oversight. This is how Congress monitors the bureaucracy. Really, it monitors how the laws it passes are being enacted, and that's something we'll talk about more when we get into the president and bureaucracy. All right, thanks for joining me for topic two on Congress, organization, and leadership. Please make sure to fill out the Google form.